Today, we're going to be talking about overcoming the, the limiting beliefs, the lies that we believe that actually prevent us from experiencing the kind of success and happiness we would like to experience in life. You know, as a human being on this planet, you know, devoted to overcoming uh, challenges, uh, the issues that I have in life, uh, I'm very familiar and acquainted with limiting beliefs and uh, the, the insecurities. And that's, that's the kind of baggage that people bring to their relationships. So you got two people that are coming with these insecurities and these, I'm going to call them uh, limiting beliefs, these lies that we believe. And that shapes the way we see um, people and the world. And when we react to those uh, preconceived ideas, those uh, reactions can create uh, problems in a relationship. So we, we need to figure out how we're going to uh, respond to those roadblocks in our lives so that we can connect better with our spouses and be able to perform better in our lives. There's a story, ancient history, a story that I learned from my brother-in-law. He shared this with me, and uh, I thought this was absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to share this story with you. Uh, during the late medieval period, around the 15th, 17th century, there was this weird psychiatric disorder that swept through Europe. And many people began to believe that they were made out of glass and that they would they would shatter if they came into the slightest contact with other people or things and so this order this disorder was uh, later named or termed the glass delusion and this is actually recorded in the the research journal history of Psychi Psychi psychiatry so such a crazy belief right that belief that men would somehow fall apart, shatter, uh, led some to to go to extreme lengths in trying to protect themselves. They would, uh, for example, this one guy, uh, to avoid getting shattered, in order to relieve himself, he would need to stand to relieve himself because he, he believed that if he sat down, that he would his 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 back end would shatter. In fact, he would wear padding, and he would avoid you know any contact with other people. Uh, another reporter um, that suffered from the, another sufferer that was reported was actually the French King Charles the Sixth, and he refused to let anyone touch him, and he actually wore reinforced clothing to protect him from getting bumped and protect him from getting shattered. So most of us, when we think of this, this, this delusion, this belief that people had that somehow they could get bumped wrong and then they would shatter is just, we, we would think that's just ridiculous. It's stupid. It's, it doesn't even make any sense, but that's kind of, that's the point is that it isn't about what's reasonable. Um, it's really about how we feel. And oftentimes the lies that we believe about ourselves, uh, they, they just don't have a lot of substance to support them. And they're based on fears like the fear of getting shattered. And once that fear kind of becomes ingrained, we do almost anything to actually protect that fear because if we protect that fear, then we protect ourselves from getting hurt. And that's what feeds into these false beliefs. So I thought I would look up on the internet, you know, Google search what other people thought was a limiting belief. And here's a couple of definitions that I found. I thought they were pretty good. A limiting belief are limiting beliefs are those which constrain us in some way. Just by believing them, we do not think or do or say the things that they inhibit. And in doing so, we impoverish our lives. Limiting beliefs are often about ourselves and our self-identity. 
The beliefs may also be about other people and the world in general. Another uh, definition was a limiting belief is a false belief that a person acquires as a result of making an incorrect conclusion about something in life. For example, a person could acquire a limiting belief about his ability to succeed as soon as he fails. Now, I looked up these beliefs, you know, uh, just actually today um, to see what, see how I, my ideas about what a limiting belief was um, in compared to other professionals. Uh, this is kind of how I believe that limiting beliefs are created in life. Uh, there's not a lot of research done on limiting beliefs. So these are some things that in my 20 years of personal and professional experience, see limiting beliefs. So when something bad happens in our lives, whether we're young or old, and we don't have the uh, context to make sense of what happened, we don't understand the, the intentions behind someone else's behavior, and we don't understand uh, why these things happen, what happens is we begin to make sense of them in a illogical or magical way. We, we, we're trying to connect the dots, but sometimes we miss a lot of dots in trying to create a story to explain what happened and why those bad things happen. And those magical beliefs actually uh, fuel or become insecurities. And we create rules around those insecurities. And those rules are the beliefs that we have about ourselves or about the world. This is a, a sad example, but if a girl gets sexually abused, then it could be very easy for that girl to uh, believe that all guys are dangerous. And so they only want one thing, and so just become a man hater. And so that belief can function as a protective strategy as they grow up. Another person might believe that there's something inherently wrong with them, and therefore, that's why bad things continue, continue to happen to them. And so, notice that that's a terrible explanation, and it lacks a lot of logic, but it has this magical uh, solution to explain why bad things happen. I'm just, there's, I'm just inherently broken, there's something inherently wrong with me, and the stars are lined up constantly against me, so no matter what I do, I'll never be successful. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so these walls that protect us at first actually become the prison walls that prevent us from living a free and happy and healthy life. So for example, the young woman who believes that all men are terrible and all they want is one thing, that keeps them safe for a while. But then when they become late in or early adulthood, they feel the sense of loneliness and a sense of longing. And so they want to connect with somebody, develop a relationship. But it's hard to develop a relationship with somebody who's of the opposite sex, who is a guy. And that, con, that, that, that violates the rule about how all guys are bad. And so they develop this like hot and cold you know, should I be vulnerable? No, I should. Should I be vulnerable? No, I should. And so it totally uh, messes with someone's mind, and that can really destroy a relationship. The uh, the lack of being able to identify or deal with those limiting beliefs, uh, they they set us up to become triggered or have knee jerk reactions to sit certain situations. And so those knee-jerk reactions to situations would just be called a trigger. We react without really thinking through why we're acting the way that we are or the consequences that uh, as a result from them. And when we react to those without thinking clearly, that poorly, uh, <laughs> well, it's not even decided, that in psychological terms, we, we, talk, we talk about how when someone reacts to something or is triggered, they decompensate, they, they regress, 
they they lose their logical reasonable capacities and they go into the primal which isn't very mature the primal response which is a uh, uh, fight or flight and if you're fighting or flighting in a relationship that creates more instability into the relationship and that's just going to make the situation even worse i have an insecurity i react to that insecurity and when i react to that insecurity it makes the situation even worse so we need to identify those limiting beliefs those insecurities and then challenge them replace them i thought it might be interesting to just kind of i just did a brainstorm of limiting beliefs and maybe one or two of these things might fit you maybe none of these do maybe you have your own flavor of limiting beliefs but we all have insecurities and i've talked with all sorts of people in all levels of success and we all have limiting or you know, limiting beliefs or insecurities um, if I'm not worried then I don't care I can't lose weight only thin people can enjoy sex success is for other people not me I can't focus if there's clutter there's something inherently wrong with me my opinion isn't important I'm destined to fail no matter how hard I try I'll never be good enough so why try I can't change anything about me. It's not worth bringing up because if I do, it'll only cause a flight. If I'm not perfect, I'm not worth anything. And if I can't be perfect doing something, I shouldn't even try. I'm not very smart. I'm not a good test taker. The list is endless. There's so many of them and everybody has their own flavors. And those limiting beliefs comes from situations in life that they that they couldn't comprehend or understand. They don't see why or how those things happen. And so they have this belief that, oh, this explains why I'm not. I'm, I'm just, I didn't do good on a test. I'm not a good test taker. We don't strategize or find out how to take tests differently. And I might struggle with certain types of questions. But the idea I'm not a good test taker becomes in itself a self-fulfilling prophecy. So let's talk about how to overcome limiting beliefs. Let's see, I, I want to, uh, uh, I'll share an example of how to overcome limiting beliefs because I think with an example, uh, an analogy, we can start to parallel and I'll use this uh, example as a parallel to to help us walk through the steps of how to take a situation that's happened in our lives that created real uh, pain and destruction and then how to overcome that and actually actually grow from it actually make it even better so it's it's uh, the, the parallel or the the example is a snake bite imagine you're out hiking and you hear this little rattle and you can't figure out where that rattle is coming from and you look down and there's this coiled up snake and before you know it bam you get a snake bite on your ankle and and what do you do when you get a snake bite you know you don't just do the cowboy you know cut it open and suck out the poison on your ankle the only way to truly get rid of that poison to treat a snake bite is to get the antivenom. Now, until that antivenom is given to you, that poison is circulating through your body. It's in the bloodstream now, and the 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 toxins in the the venom start to destroy living cells. And since that poison is now into your system, you can't suck it out. You can't get rid of the poison. That poison is in your body. So what do we do? We introduce the antivenom. The antivenom is we get a syringe of that in our bloodstream. And that antivenom finds those toxins and then locks on to those toxins so that, that toxin cannot be destructive anymore. These, these antibodies kill it, or not kill it, they just uh, they lock it and so that it can't be destructive. The poison is still in the system. 
but it doesn't have any ability to destroy. That's the key. And once it doesn't have an ability to destroy, well, here's the here's the interesting thing about someone who has a snake bite. Someone who has a snake bite and who gets the anti venom, if they get bit by a rattlesnake again, their body will respond completely differently. They won't have the same type of reaction to someone who gets a snake bite who hasn't had the anti venom. And so when someone gets a snake bite, they aren't going to be uh, uh, damaged as much. So now let's take the snake bite uh, analogy and then compare that to trauma that someone might feel or experience in life. Let's say something bad happens to somebody. Here's an example. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the sexual abuse one. That, that's a potent one. It's an, and I, I don't like talking about it, but it's a real deal. So sexual abuse happens. It's a real trauma. I, I could call it, you know, let me do a different one. Infidelity. Infidelity. Okay, an affair happens. It's terrible. It is betrayal trauma. It's a real thing. This isn't something that you just imagine. This is real hurt. This is real loss. This is real damage. And in that real hurt, real loss, and real damage, that person is justified in experiencing the pain. And that, the, the thoughts that go with it, the, the fears that go with it, the beliefs that are now created from it. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be able to compare myself. Um, I'll never be able to forgive that person. I'll never be able to trust that person. So those are the beliefs that we have when we are, when we have this trauma. Those actually become self-limiting beliefs. We, we don't want to trust somebody that we've already decided will never, ever deserve our trust. And so, although adultery is a real severe trauma, it's not imaginary. Neither is a snake bite. But we can run around frustrated, pissed off that we got a snake bite and not introduce the anti-venom and end up dying, same thing with infidelity. It is true pain. It is true damage. I don't want to, I don't want to limit, I don't want you to think that somehow I'm um, minimizing the destruction of adultery. But we still have to deal, because this happens so often, when we actually have um, betrayal trauma treatment programs. And I'm all about treating betrayal trauma. I, I'm so supportive of it. But when betrayal trauma becomes the topic and we reinforce the trauma and support the trauma, well, we stay traumatized. It's like going to a support group for people who got bit by a snake. If we're just talking about how valid it is that everyone's dying because you know they got bit by a snake that's not going to help the anti-venom of trauma in relationships and in our lives is perspective so the antidote to the poison is perspective we create value and meaning from the trauma, which can be really frustrating for people because they believe somehow that if I'm going to create value from the trauma, then I'm saying that the trauma is okay. No, what I'm saying is, is if you get bit by a snake, we're going to create a sense of perspective so that we become stronger in spite of, or actually because of the snake bite. Because the other alternative is to suffer and be destroyed from the inside out and end up dying emotionally or physically, depending on what kind of snake bite you got. So what we want to do is we want to find a sense of perspective to 
uh, which will limit the pain and minimize the destructive effects of the trauma. Okay, it doesn't reverse it, it just limits it. And then what we do is we heal from that trauma and we grow and become stronger, not only in spite of it, but because of it. So there's three steps in what I what I created, three steps in overcoming the trauma and overcoming the limiting beliefs that we have. First thing we need to do is we need to expose the lie from the truth. We need to expose the lie. Um, how we do that is we write down, and I would say write it down because it'll help us you know, follow this process. First step is write down the thoughts or beliefs that you have about yourself, another person, the world, the situation. Write the thought or belief that you have about that situation and that makes you feel bad, that makes you feel uh, discouraged. Now, we need to separate the, what's false from what is true because there are some beliefs that we might have that make us feel bad but are true. And we need to accept those things. We also need to separate the ones from the things that aren't true because it'll make a difference on how we approach things. Let's say, for example, uh, it, which is true. Now, everyone has this on a relative scale, but my kids, uh, it was just about, um, it was uh, in uh, in December. I was gaining some Christmas weight. Okay, I was up to about two hundred pounds, almost two hundred pounds, and uh, my kids gave me crap about you know being fat. Now I know I wasn't like huge fat, but I guess what I was fat for for me. And uh, so the first step is what's the belief? The belief is is gosh, Emil, you're fat. Now I look at this. I feel bad about that. I'm discouraged by that. I'm, ah, crap. That's not fun. What's true and what's not true? So the first step is, what evidence do I have to support the fact that I'm fat? Okay. My pants don't fit like they used to. Mm -hmm. I'm 10 pounds more than I've ever weighed. And I've been gaining that weight pretty steadily uh, that winter, just recently. Um... And that's that's legitimate truth. You step on the scale, boom, 197. Yep, that's how much you weigh. I should be about 185, hopefully closer to 180. And so I'm overweight. And that doesn't make me feel good. It's affecting my health. It's I'm borderline diabetic. Yeah, these are all things that are really true. That's a fact. And I feel bad. But let's look at some of the thoughts that people have associated with that. There's nothing I can do about how much I weigh. What's true about that? I'd have to look at that. What's true about that? You know, um, I, uh, I've dieted and I've only been able to lose so much weight and I can't keep it off. Okay, so certain diets I've followed have only led to short-term results. Okay, that's true. What else is true about that? Um, even when I exercise and run, it doesn't change how much I weigh. I've ran and it still doesn't really change how much I weigh. Maybe only four or five pounds and then I, I just stop. Hmm. So I look at what's true about that belief and then I do what's not true. What are the evidence do I have that's not true? Well, I have been able to lose weight when I was sick and didn't eat hardly anything. And that sucks. I was able to lose weight when I followed this diet to a certain point, And then I stopped that diet. And that's probably not going to work. I didn't run and have a diet. So I start looking at all the evidence and say, gosh, you know what? There are times when I've lost weight and I actually can lose weight. Now I have two different sets of evidence and I'm going to bring them together for step number two. Step number two is create a replacement belief that is true, that contains both perspectives of what is and what isn't true. 
So with the weight loss, it is, you know what, Emil? You are fat. That is true. You have gained some serious weight. And the part about you can't do anything about it, I haven't found a, a, uh, a consistent way to lose weight even though I have had some success in the past losing weight. Okay, that's the new belief. So now that gives me some ideas of where to go. I might need to do something different. I might need to find out, find a nutritionist, find a personal trainer, try to figure out what I need to do to tap into my chemistry or my goals or my whatever to help me lose the weight that I really want to lose. And that is step number three. Step number three is get to work. Do something about that new belief. So if it's losing weight, I'm going to do something to uh, change my weight. Now, okay, that's about losing weight. Let's talk about something else. Let me give you another example to really drive these points home. I get on the plane one day flying home from Atlanta. And uh, um, this was a few years ago. I went and did some uh, presentation. And I'm getting on the plane. And here's this guy. He's got this scruffy beard, this, you know, greasy hat pulled over his, you know, up to his eyebrows. He's got a backpack on wearing shorts in the middle of winter, and from the knee down, he has metal legs and and the red, white, and blue American flag Converse All-Star shoes on his prosthetic legs. And I'm like, I am sitting next to a really interesting story. I've got to find out about this guy. So I, if I remember right, I think his name is Brady. Anyway, he tells me the story of what happened. He took, I think he served, if my memory is correct, he served two or three, um, uh, what do they call when you go? Anyway, uh, he had to go, went to the military in Afghanistan three, three times, whatever they're called. I can't think of what they are. And then in that, uh, in his, uh, on his, uh, when he went, went and got deployed, Three weeks before he gets, two or three weeks before he's scheduled to come home from his deployment, he steps on a landmine and blows his legs off from the knees down. Just blows them off. And so he wakes up without any legs, just that close to being sent home. And so this is real trauma. He has lost his legs. This is real loss. He will never be able to feel the grass between his toes or the sand between his toes. He will never be able to wade in water. He won't. And so he is now super depressed. Here's this Marine, this tough guy, can overcome everything. And now his quality of life has tanked. And he goes into this depression for months. And you know what he thinks about? Everything that he cannot do anymore. How the quality of life has been robbed from him. And so now he's contemplating suicide. He just doesn't want to live anymore. But he doesn't feel like he has the, the right to take his own life when so many of his friends have died. And so he's contemplating well, what is he going to do? If he's not going to kill himself, what is he going to do? And all of a sudden, something changed. He started asking a question like, well, what can I do? Well, if I can't do all of these things, which is evidence of real loss, what can I do? So let's walk through the process. Notice, no, he, these are the, some of the thoughts he had. No one's going to want me. Because I'm damaged goods. Hmm. Is that true or not true? What kind of person would want to live and marry a guy that has his legs blown off? Well, someone who's pretty deep. Someone who's not very shallow. Someone who can see the value of the character of the person and isn't going to be superficial about how someone looks on the outside. Well, that actually sounds like a pretty decent woman. 
So now he's looking at, well, what can I do? What, how does this injury add value to me? What can I do? So he's, he used to snowboard. So then he gets into snowboarding again. He has to relearn snowboarding. He has to get used to these prosthetic legs. He has to start all over. But he's now committed because now he has this mantra. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And the more he looks at what he can do, the more the world begins to open up before him. So he he's actually, he competed in the Paralympics in snowboarding and actually did pretty well. I can't remember if he got silver or whatever, but he did pretty well. Then he starts working as a, um, as a sales rep for guys that do make prosthetic legs and that are designing this Achilles tendon which is one of the biggest challenges for how people walk with fake legs because it's part of the gait. They can't get a good um, uh, fake um, prosthetic uh, Achilles heel, Achilles tendon. And so he starts representing this, this manufacturer. And then what do you know? He now goes on the speaking circuit talking to people and vets, especially on how to overcome obstacles in life. He starts to create value and meaning from the trauma. It doesn't take away the reality that he got his legs blown off, but now the quality of his life is actually more rich and beneficial because of what he's lost and what he's gained. So, the quality of life isn't based on what we lose. It's based on what we gain from what we've experienced in life. So those are the three things that you need to do to overcome these limiting beliefs. What, what, identify truth from the lie. Create a new belief that incorporates both sides of the story. And then get to work. Start doing things. That will change things. So for me, I was fat. Yep, that is actually 100% true. So what's the new belief? I am fat and I can do something about it. What's the third number thing? Get to work. If I failed multiple times, what's the belief that I have? What if I told you that you were destined to succeed at anything you tried to do. And in fact, every roadblock that you had to overcoming that, um, that frustration or that barrier was a witness to the universe. I know this sounds like hippie talk, that you were deserving the, the, the success that you're trying to accomplish. I took roadblocks to mean that that success was not intended for me. I took it as a redirect rather than an opportunity to prove my, uh, my worthiness to receive that success. Each success has doors and locks. The doors are the barriers that prevent us our willingness to find the key to unlock that door is what gives us the next the stage to the next level of toward our success. When we think that we can just set our minds to something and then we won't reach any barriers, we are delusional. But when we are determined, because we're if we believe that our, we are we are destined to succeed. We will continue to break through those doors until there is no door that separates us from the success that is in our destiny. And it is the growth that we accomplish by finding the key, the solution to that problem that allows us the opportunity to go to the next stage toward our success. Every great thinker, every successful person knows this to be true. The book, Think and Grow Rich, is a catalog 
of people who have applied that very same principle. They didn't believe what they couldn't do. They figured out how they were going to do what was impossible. I just want to throw this in at the very end um, because I think that how we see ourselves, how we believe, um, how we how we perce yeah how we perceive ourselves uh, can make a huge difference, a huge impact on. If we have negativity, and I believe negativity um, is a is a very real and tangible but um, invisible substance. It is a substance. You know that feeling when you're stressed out and you, you feel burdened by frustrations and the, a bad day? You feel it. It's heavy. It's weighty. There is substance to it. And if you take that negativity and you vent or you dump it on somebody else, they now have the negativity. You feel lighter because you don't have it anymore, but then you give it to somebody else. Could be your sister, your brother, your husband, your mom, doesn't matter. When you get rid of that negativity. So what I'm trying to say is negativity is substance. It's material. It's real. It's tangible. It's just invisible. That negativity, that invisible substance, it, it interferes with our ability to find happiness, satisfaction in our life. It adds to uh, low self-esteem. Uh, it adds to our depression. It saps our energy. And when it, when it does those kinds of things, then it has a direct impact on the quality of our life and on the quality of our relationships. We somehow believe that how we treat ourselves, we can be as negative as we want to with ourselves. We understand that we can't be negative with everybody. Like this example of if you're negative with somebody, if you dump your negativity and you feel better and they feel worse. Um, sometimes we believe that we can actually be negative to ourselves. And if we're negative to ourselves, it doesn't have the same rule. And I'm here to tell you that it does have the same rule. When you're negative to yourself, you add more negative weight, more substance that, that, that burdens you with life. So there's a strategy. If we, if we believe that we can be negative to ourselves, it actually is, it limits our ability to succeed because when we're discouraged, we don't have the motivation to, to engage and to overcome those barriers. When we're discouraged, we just want to give up. So there's um, three elements to deal with uh, self-talk so that it's not negative. And, and I would just suggest, and I'm going to kind of give you a, a, an outline of this. When you have self-talk and you want to do some improvement with yourself, uh, the process is positive, supportive, and encouraging. Positive, supportive, encouraging. In fact, if you're positive, supportive, and encouraging, you can be as critical as you want to yourself and probably to anyone else if you can phrase it in a positive, supportive, and encouraging way. If you aren't being positive, supportive, and encouraging, and instead you're being negative, okay, and I don't know what the, and, dis, and discouraging, okay, what's the lack of um, supportive, uh, the opposite of supportive, if you're negative, the opposite of supportive, and you're discouraging, there's no more motivation. It's empty, and you won't overcome those barriers. So the psyche, that, that, that story we tell ourselves that it's okay for us to be hard on ourselves, to be negative to ourselves because we want to improve, is actually a not very functional strategy. So anything that we have about ourselves, if we can stay at it, state it in a positive, supportive, and encouraging way, then we will be motivated to overcome our barriers. So in my mind, I might tell myself a different story. I might say something to the effect of, you know, Emil, when you're eating healthy, notice how I'm positive, you're eating healthy. You, when you're staying regular with your fitness, when you surround yourself 
with healthy snacks. Here's the supportive evidence to support the idea that that, ex that behavior will create change. You feel better and you lose weight. Now that's the supportive. That's that's evidence that either theoretical or actual evidence that supports the new behavior. And then the third thing is is encouraging. And Emo, you can do it. You've done it before. You've done hard things. You can accomplish anything. Now notice, if I have that going in my mind all the time, I can do this. I like eating healthy foods. It makes me feel good. It helps me lose weight. I like to exercise. When I exercise, I feel good. And Emo, you can do it. My mind is focused on the presence of what I do want, not the absence of what I don't want. And my mind, the way the psyche works is it thinks about and focuses on what I'm thinking about. So I'm thinking about don't eat, you know, treats, don't eat sweets, don't eat, don't drink soda pop, don't. Well, notice my brain is focusing on the things that I shouldn't be focusing on instead of on the presence of what I do want. So negative is the absence of what I don't want instead of the presence of what I do want. So being positive supportive and encouraging is a way to deal with the daily thoughts that are designed to improve us but actually create more problems. If you find yourself in a situation where you feel lethargic and discouraged and weighted down, write down the thoughts that you have. Notice how they're negative in nature. They are discouraging, debilitating, Take those same thoughts and then rewrite them in a way that's positive, supportive, and encouraging. When we're positive, when we have light, when we take the negativity of our lives and we find value and meaning and purpose from those things, we change the very energy that we have and we become more satisfied and happy in life. We're able to connect better with our spouse because we don't have the baggage anymore that prevents us from feeling close. That's why it's important to overcome the limiting beliefs that prevent us from having success in life. Let's see if anybody's got any questions. All right, if you have any questions, email me and I will um, send th these answers to you. I'm also going to put with this webinar, it'll probably be tomorrow, a, a kind of a, a guide sheet that you can use to refer to to help you apply these principles, because sometimes talking about them is a little bit harder than reading them. So you'll be able to find those strategies in, writ in, in written terms so you can take your limiting beliefs and process them and replace them with positive ones.